I mean, it's also Friday and it's like weird time zones all around the world. So some of the people, most of the people won't join, but mm -hmm. a lot of people are watching the videos after the recording. So excellent. Uh, so don't, don't be alarmed if not that many people show up. <laughs> I, I also, at this point, very little can alarm me. Um, I'm like, if people yeah. show up, great. They don't, that's okay. I just, just means I, I prepare to talk. It'll be better for next time. Um, we're yeah, this is the only video. All around the world. Does yeah, I see it live. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. All right. It looks good. Uh, Dorota, you're in great hands with Rachel. Um, you two have fun. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'll miss it, but I'll see you later. Um, okay. And I guess I'll see you in Seattle probably in the in the spring because I'm gonna go there and host a INT workshop. Ah, excellent, so. excellent. I realize I just stopped sharing despite all the hard work that we did. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely see you in in Seattle then in the spring, if not earlier. Yeah, hopefully earlier. I might be in the <laughs> West Coast before then, so maybe we'll we'll bump into each other before then. So yeah, definitely. All right. All right. Well, bye. Take care. I'll see you guys later. Bye, everybody. Okay. So let me just get that. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So then I think we are good. So I don't want <clears throat> to mispronounce your last name, <laughs> which I, I might. Uh, let me. So Dorota Grabowska? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm quite unparticular about how people pronounce my name because there's like an Americanized version and there's the Polish one. Um, and, and it's e like one is easier for others and it's, it's not something that, that bothers me too much. So that was perfect. Morning, Kevin. Good morning, Rachel. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, sorry for the mess up. Uh, I don't know what happened. Like uh, the staff that was helping you guys, uh, it's out of office. Hopefully he's okay. Um, but I didn't get any work. So, but we're live. We're uh, ready to start. Okay. Great. All right. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we have people joining us from all over the globe today. And so, I am Rachel White. I'm part of the Rageous team here at ODU, and um, it is my honor to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Dorota Grabowska is a theoretical physicist focusing on particle and nuclear physics. In recent years, they, they um, have taken a keen interest in quantum computing as a novel avenue for addressing open problems in physics. While we may be many decades away from large-scale quantum computers, Dorota believes that in the meantime, there are many interesting questions to be addressed. So without further ado, Dorota. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very excited to be talking here and getting to tell all of you about sort of my two overlapping interests, which is trying to understand subatomic physics from first principles, and then also how to put it onto a quantum computer. A little, bit of, a little bit of background on myself. As was mentioned, I am a... Um, theoretical particle physicist currently working at CERN um, in Geneva, Switzerland, also bordering uh, France, and I'm one of the coordinators for the Quantum Technology Initiative. So with that, let me first start with the standard model of particle physics. So this is really the baseline of all of my research is this idea that we've organized the fundamental aspects of our universe into something called the standard model. So to introduce the standard model, let me go back to the very, very beginning to sort of the early days of, of particle physics. And so this was uh, in the late 1800s, looking at the gold foil experiment. And I kind of like to start here because this experiment is one of the experiments that sort of highlights the many surprises that we've had experimentally over the past century, century and a half. Oh gosh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> I forgot to quit Skype. <laughs> um, all right, so with the gold foil experiment. So the general idea of the gold foil experiment is that we had discovered the electron already about 10 years previously, and we knew that there, was, there were atoms, right? The idea of atoms has a sort of long history. And the general idea here is that people wanted to understand what was inside the atom. 
So the idea was to look at the scattering pattern of alpha particles off of a thin film of gold, of gold, and this would somehow let us see inside the atom. And at this point, there was some idea about how the atom would look. This was called the plum pudding model. And so in this model, you had essentially uh, electrons zipping around in this diffuse positive charge. So here's kind of a picture of it. We have this red is our diffuse positive charge. The electron are the little blue dots. Kind of looks like a plum pudding, right? The electrons are, are the plums. Now, the idea here is that if you were um, to scatter an alpha particle, which is the sort of nucleus of a um, helium, what you would see is very, very small angles scattering. Essentially, this, these alpha particles would just go through that gold foil and have just very little scattering due to the sort of low density of positive charge. However, this was not what was seen. It was, in fact, very, very shocking. So let's redo the experiment and sort of see what they actually saw back in the late 1800s. Again, we scatter helium uh, two plus, and there's a large angle scattering. And so what the result is that what the experimentalists saw, namely Heinz Geiger and Ernest Martzen, is they saw this large angle scattering, which was not consistent with a very diffuse positive charge, but in fact, an extremely concentrated positive charge sort of shown here in the middle. So this was a discovery of the nucleus. And when Rutherford, who was the head of the lab at that point, asked about, was asked how surprised he was about this result, he said that it was like having shot a gun at a piece of tissue paper and had the bullet bounce back. So no one really expected this result. And that has kind of been consistent with the discovery of the various components of the standard model, that essentially over a century of experimental um, experimental searches, we've seen a multitude of surprises forcing us to develop new theories and formulations. And at the end of the day, we finally have a self-consistent picture that somehow encapsulates all known fundamental particles and their interactions. And this is the standard model. So what is the standard model? What are the components? What are the interactions? So within the standard model, we have the 12 fermions shown here on the sort of outer circle. Starting over here, we have the quarks, the up quark, the charm quark, the top quark, and then also the down quark, the strange, and the bottom. On the lower half of this circle, we have what are called the leptons. So there's the electron, the muon, the tau, and then the corresponding neutrinos, so 12 fermions. Now these fermions all interact with each other, and the way that they interact is with the force carriers. And there's four force carriers within the standard model. There is the photon, the gluon, and the W and the Z. And then lastly, there is also one boson, this infamous Higgs boson that was discovered in 2012, almost exactly under my feet here at CERN. So let's take a quick look at these sort of these four types of interactions to kind of see how the standard model gives rise to essentially everything that we see around ourselves. So the first is electromagnetism, which is the sort of interaction that's responsible for us being able to meet and have this physics talk, despite the fact that we are all separated by probably thousands of kilometers. So electromagnetism interacts with these nine fermions, the quarks and the charged leptons, and the force carrier is this photon, this gamma. Moving on, we also have the weak force, which is responsible for radioactive nuclear decays and also the strange pop property of our world that left is not the same as right. Namely, our universe and our mirror universe are not the same. Um, and in this case, the force carriers are the W and the Z. And the weak force is unique in that it is the one standard model force that talks with all of the fermions. And then lastly, and perhaps the force that is very near and dear to my heart is the strong force. And this is the force that's responsible for binding quarks and gluons into protons, neutrons, pions, and also other hadrons. And in this case, the force carrier over here is the gluon. Now, for those who are counting, you'll realize that I've left off one type of force carrier um, within the standard model, and that's gravity. We know gravity exists. It's why we are uh, standing on a planet but we don't really put it into the standard model for reasons I'm happy to explain later. So with gravity, let's just not talk about it. Okay, 
So with that, well, what remains to be done within the standard model, right? We have this complete unified picture. We discovered the Higgs in 2012. And so it seems that the standard model is complete. So is there anything else for us to do? Is there anything left for us to do? And luckily the answer is yes, and also so very much. Um, so here are sort of a list of questions that, that scientists, that particle and nuclear physicists are still trying to understand. And some of these we are still not very close to an answer. So one, for example, is the nature of dark invisible matter. So when we look out into the galaxy and we see, let's say the galaxy rotation curves or how galaxy, galaxies rotate, we see that there is missing mass in our universe, but we've never been able to detect it in our detectors or, or in any other way that's not gravitational. So we actually don't know how this missing matter behaves. We just know that it's there. Another question is, well, gravity, why is gravity so weak? Also, how do we make quantum gravity, right? In this, the standard model of particle physics, I explicitly excluded gravity. And that's because we don't really know how to self-consistently include it in our picture. Now, this is a big issue because obviously we know gravity exists. We have to somehow put it in. And many people are actively working. There's many ideas about how to include quantum gravity. Additionally, you can ask about the neutrinos. Within the standard model of particle physics, neutrinos are massless. By definition, by their properties, they have to be massless. And yet, when we look out into the universe, we see neutrino oscillations, and we see that neutrinos are very, very light, but in fact, massive. And so we have models to try and explain why that mass exists, but none have been confirmed to be the sort of true model over any others. Additionally, there's questions about why the Higgs is so light. This is called the hierarchy problem. Um, we can look even further and ask why, these, why is the universe expanding? We don't have a good uh, proven theory for that. And then also, we don't know why we even exist. Within the standard model, there's not enough sort of interactions to allow for more matter to exist than antimatter. And yet when we look around our Earth, there's definitely significantly more matter than antimatter. So trying to explain that, this baryon asymmetry, is also a big question. So these are just some of the questions that you know, a lot of my colleagues and collaborators are thinking about, trying to address why the world looks the way that it does. Now, all of these are very interesting for me, but the one that I'm currently really thinking about is this question of how do we go from something that is so simple, this sort of standard model here on the right-hand side, nope, sorry, left-hand side, how do we go from something that is so simple to, well, all of this complexity that we see around us, right? Essentially, how do we go from something so simple that can give us can give rise to such beautiful complexity. So is this question of emergent phenomena. It's not enough to know the components of the standard model. It's, we also need to figure out how they all come together and how these interactions occur to give us something, again, like all the phenomena that we see around each other. And this is where quantum computing comes in, or per perhaps more clearly said, the idea of computing in uh, particle nuclear physics and generally in science in general. So first, there's the question of, well, what is computing, right? I mean, we, you know, we're talking right now on a computer, so we have a sense of computers existing, but what is actually computing? So for me, the best way that I tend to, that I found to think about computing is that computing is essentially using physical systems and logical rules to do calculations that might otherwise be intractable. And I really like this definition because it tells you that just about anything can be used as a computer. You just have to figure out the rules for what you wanna be doing. So here on this slide, I show a couple of different examples of um, different types of what I would call computers. So for example, here on the left-hand side, this is an Incan uh, Yupana, which is a um, way of doing calculations and addition. And as far as I've read, no one has really quite figured out how this was used, but it was known that it was used for counting. Um, on the bottom, we have the Chinese abacus, which is also used in many different cultures, one of the sort of first uh, actual calculators that existed. 
And then lastly, on the right hand side, we have one bit logic controllers, which instead of using beans, like both the Incan uh, Yupana and the Chinese Abacus use, instead use um, electrical voltages and things like that. So the big thing, again, is that just about anything can be used for a is used as a computer, it just might be more or less efficient. So with this idea, we can think about actually constructing our own sort of computing toolkit. Um, and I want to do this by introducing the idea of binary and how we use binary in classical computing. So the example is that I don't even have to think about using, let's say, a computer. I can actually use coins and construct my own computing system. So essentially, I want to demonstrate how we can use heads and tails on a coin to carry out addition. And so I'm going to use both a color and accounting scheme. So I'm going to call I'm going to call tails red and mark it as a zero and then call heads uh, blue and mark it with a one. Now the question is how do we now take coins and make a calculator? So step one is we first need to somehow translate between numbers and ordered coins. And we can do this using something called binary or base two. So in this case, I can define, um, uh, yeah, sorry, zero as, as the zero, um, one as this one. And now when I go to two, well, I have to start using more numbers because I don't have another, I don't have another tail or a head. So then I have to sort of do this shift. So if you go through all of this, you can sort of construct this, this counting method. Um, and now this is essentially known as binary, known as base two. And now with this, we can use heads and tails on coins to actually carry out addition. So for our second step is we need to create a set of consistent rules. So in this case, A, if I, I can sort of construct this sort of counting method, where if I have two reds together, I get another red. If I have a red and a blue, I get a blue. And then lastly, I can have a blue and a blue. And the rule here is that I still have a red in this first slot, but I also need a blue in my second slot. So the rules can be written out in the following, that if A and B are the same, you're gonna make S red. If A and B are different, you're gonna make S blue. And then lastly, if A and B are both blue, you can make the C coin blue. And now with this, you can actually start doing calculations. And now this example that I've laid out is actually is built around this exact same idea. Modern day computing is built around the same idea as coin flips. It's just significantly more developed both algorithmic, algorithmically and technologically. So again, I can use this idea of my uh, red coin or my blue coin or the two sides of a coin, but make it electronic. So essentially have different sides, um, sorry, essentially have some sort of uh, electronic version using things like a voltage difference. So the electronic version of a coin is called a bit. Um, and then the logical operations that we perform on bits are called gates. And so in fact, sort of what I've shown here is the gate for it's called the half adder, which is what carries out this addition, which has the sort of rules that, that I um, presented above. Now, as I mentioned, I laid out a very simple example. We have now taken you know, classical computing way beyond this. So now in modern day computing, we have classical computation that has pushed through essentially exo, exo scale. Um, and so these are uh, supercomputers that are now coming online that can let us do essentially an exo scale amount of flops per second. So these are these massive, massive supercomputers. And in fact, within the US, there's three um, really large ones. There's Perlmutter, which can get to 70.9 petaflops. There's Summit, which can get to 200 petaflops. And then there's Aurora, which is not yet built, but the hope is that Aurora can get to two exoflops. And just to give you a sense of just how powerful these computers are, a flop is essentially a floating, floating point operation. So it's a single, you can think about it as like a single number addition. So this machine, Aurora, can do 10 to the 15 of these, or sorry, 10 to the 18 of these per second. So these are massive, massive machines. Okay, well, what does that mean for science, for physics? So I'm a um, particle physicist. 
So for me, I like to think a lot about how to do the strong interactions. So strong interactions being um, essentially what gives rise to nuclear physics at low energies. And now this is a really interesting problem for, for physicists because it's a really challenging one as there's really no good approximations that we can make when trying to do calculations of nuclear physics. So if you want to go from strong interactions from quantum chromodynamics to nuclear physics, which is what we see um, around us, you really have to put it on a computer. You don't get to make any other approximations. And so what we do is we now we use what's called lattice QCD, which is what allows us for first principle studies of low energy strong interactions. And so in this case, the way that this works is I take my, my theory, I take my space time, so sort of the, the space of where I'm moving and my theory is evolving, and I discretize it. So I have a finite number of points shown here, and I can put my um, particles onto that mesh or onto that grid. So in this case, the quarks, these sort of fermions that interact are gonna go on these sort of intersections of these grid lines, which are called sites. And then my gluons, the force carriers of the strong interactions are going to exist, be, are gonna essentially be connecting these two sites. Um, and they're sort of put into the, these objects you. But that's essentially what we do. We take our theory of the strong interactions from the standard model, we discretize our space time, we put finite volume, and all of this lets us then put this theory onto a computer and simulate it because now everything is nice and happy and finite. So in some sense, here's another picture of the same thing. We now have this three-dimensional box and then our um, three types of quarks or our, our sort of the quark colors are all sort of included here. Now, this turns out to be extremely computationally complex. And so in fact, we need those supercomputers that I showed on the previous slides to carry out these complex simulations. And this has now been done you know, for a couple of decades. Um, so as an example to show you why nuclear physics is so difficult, here this movie on the right is the vacuum of the strong interactions. So this is something that would normally be thought of as very simple, right? The vacuum is just empty space. But in fact, with QCD, because it's strong interacting, there's a lot of dynamics that happen. And so simulating all of this behavior is very, very challenging. And this is why we need supercomputers. So with Lattice QCD, the end goal is to really try and understand the behavior of the strong interactions at different temperatures and densities using numerical simulations. And what I mean by this is here on this right-hand side of the plot, what I've done is sketch what's called the phase diagram of QCD, where on the x-axis, we have the baryon density. So more and more nuclei getting pulled together or more and more quarks getting put together. And on the y-axis, I, I have the temperature. So increasing or decreasing the amount of, let's say, heat. And what you'll see is that there's a lot of non-trivial behavior that happens. Um, there's this transition that can happen. There's neutron stars, which we've now seen in LIGO. There's free quarks and gluons. Down here is, is confined objects, such as what we see at the LHC. And so what we want is sort of from first principles, we want to try and understand this entire phase diagram, making use of um, these large numerical simulations. Now, the reality is that the method that we use, these sort of numerical simulations that we do, actually start breaking down in many interesting regions of parameter space. And in fact, it's probably in an unavoidable way. So for example, if you wanted to understand how neutron stars behave and you want to do the simulation of QCD over here, the tool that we have doesn't actually work. We cannot do a classical simulation of this. So what are we to do? Our classical computing no longer works, but neutron stars are very interesting. So what is a particle physicist to do? Well, the answer is we start going towards quantum computing, right? And this, we now have this you know, very new emergent technology that hasn't yet been fully applied to these sorts of problems. And so the hope is that maybe through quantum computing, we can better access different regions of QCD. So let me talk a little about quantum computing and sort of the ideas that go into it. So the general idea behind quantum computing is that we want to utilize the collective properties of quantum states 
So things like superposition, interference, entanglement to perform calculations. And now the expectation or the hope is that because we're using these collective properties that we'll somehow see a dramatic improvement in runtime scaling for calculations which are exponentially slow with classical methods. Now we have some reason to think that this might happen. One example is Shor's algorithm, which is a method for factoring large numbers. And what can be shown is that using, using Shor's algorithm, what is normally a very difficult problem for um, classical computing becomes actually quite easy on a quantum computer. And now the reason why this is sort of particularly interesting is that the difficulty of factoring large numbers into primes is the backbone of many encryption schemes. So let me give you a sense of just how much this speed up is. So if I look at the best classical algorithm and I say I want to factorize a integer n, well, what Shor's al what the best classical algorithm does is it can do that factorizing, scaling like the exponential of log n, where n again is the size of the integer. So this is something that is exponential. Now, if I try and do the same exact thing using Shor's algorithm on a quantum computer, well, this is shown down here. And what you see is there's no longer an exponential scaling, it's polynomial. Instead of e to the log n, we now have log n. And this is a big enough difference that once there are large enough quantum computers, this could easily break modern day encryption. Now for physics, what we hope is that through using some of these same tools that we can somehow see a similar improvement for calculations in physics, specifically in high energy physics and nuclear physics. But before I go into how that might work and how quantum computing looks, let me do a quick interlude about quantum mechanics because quantum computing relies heavily on the fundamental tenets of quantum mechanics. So the fundamental concept with quantum mechanics, which makes it so different than classical mechanics, is that the physics on short scales is probabilistic, not deterministic. So you will never really know what you're going to get until you measure it. And there's a couple things that come out of this that make quantum computing, quantum mechanics really powerful. So for example, there's this idea of superposition in quantum mechanics, which, which is the idea that the quantum state is a sum of two or more eigenstates. So if I go back to my coin idea from before, where I have one side of a coin is red, the other side is blue. Well, classically, I say one side is blue, one side is red, the coin has to be in one or the other. But quantum mechanically, I can say that the coin is acting a superposition of both of these. And you don't know whether it's the red side or the blue side until you measure it. And once you measure it, then you have a definitive answer. But before you measured it, you didn't know what it would be. Additionally, there's interference effects in, in quantum mechanics. And that can be boiled down to the idea that the objects that we think of as particles can also have wave-like properties, including things like interference, both destructive and constructive. And then lastly, and this is really what sort of starts shining in, in quantum computers, is the idea of entanglement, which is that the state of a single particle cannot always be described independently of the other. So again, if I go back to my red and blue, I can write this state that exists on a quantum computer as the sum of three coins that are both face up or red and three coins that are face down or blue. And what you'll notice is that if, for example, you measure one of the coins to be red, then in this state, you will always get the, that the other two are red. They cannot be blue. And so this is this idea that it is not sufficient to describe one of the coins. You have to describe all of them. Entanglement is also known as the spooky action at a distance that, that Einstein was going about, was discussing in the, I believe, 1920s. Okay, so taking all of that and putting it together, into digital quantum computing. So the computational strategy here is very, very similar to what we do with a classical computer. We just do it with quantum objects. So the computational strategy is that we're going to create a quantum circuit by acting on a collection of quantum bits called qubits with these logical gates. And now similar to classical computing where I said, well, anything can be used for classical computing, anything can be a bit, 
Well, for quantum, any quantum two-state system can also be used as a qubit. So for example, the most commonly used ones are things like superconducting loops, trapped ions, and also diamond vacancies. Now, for quantum computers, the gates that we use are different. Um, namely, they are reversible operations, which act on one or two qubits. So with this, we can also ask, well, where are we, right? I've told you, you know, that we are now at the exascale um, classical computing. Well, where are we with quantum computing? So we're currently what's called the noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum era, the NISC era. And what that means is that the machines that we have contain about order 100 noisy qubits that are not error corrected. And this lack of error correction is really what makes doing any sort of calculations quite difficult because it means that your machine is very sensitive to various sources of noise, including decoherence and dephasing. And the reason why this is bad is that when you have things like decoherence and dephasing, your quantum system stops being quantum. And so all of the benefits that we see from the sort of you know, entanglement and interference and, and collective properties breaks down and you can no longer carry out your calculations. But despite all of this, we do have existing quantum hardware that we can run calculations on. So here I show sort of a, a smattering of, of different um, quantum computers using different types of technology. Um, so here on the upper left, there's superconducting qubits, which are created by companies IBM Q and Rigetti. There's also these trapped ion machines made by Honeywell and IonQ. There is also a quantum-like machine or quantum machine, depending on how you want to define it, called an annealer, which is D-Wave. And then lastly, there are also um, quantum computers in academic settings using cold ions. These are these academic tabletop. Now, with us currently being in the NISC era, this is a rapidly evolving technological field. So it's important to ask, well, where are we and where will we, where will we be going in the next 10 or 15 years? So a lot of companies have put out projections about where their quantum computers are gonna be. And what we see sort of throughout the board is that there's going to be more and more qubits, these quantum bits being string, stringed together. And in fact, many companies are now projecting having over a thousand uh, qubits strung together into a quantum machine. So in particular, here's IBM's quantum roadmap from 2020. And again, they use superconducting qubits. And what you'll see, despite this is a little bit small, I apologize, um, is where we are right now is 2020. And so they said that they were gonna have 433 qubits. Um, this is sort of in development, but if you go to 2023, they have a thousand, they project having a thousand qubits network together. On the other, on the other side, ion Q, which is a trapped ion machine, is a little bit slower in actually networking their qubits because they have a very different technology. But by 2028, which is in five and a half years, they expect to have a thousand qubits strung together and the important thing about this is that they also project having some sort of error correction, a 32 to one error correction. So we're gonna be able to have larger qubits, therefore more qubits and better access to larger calculations. Now, gate noise is also really important. Many people aren't putting out how they expect their gate noise to drop. However, they are expecting that the, that gate noise, the sort of decoherence de dephasing will go down, which will allow us to construct larger circuits. Now, where does this, this leave uh, particle physicists or nuclear physicists, people who think about subatomic physics? Well, the guiding principle here is that quantum computers, the technology that we're using is really still in its infancy. And so we need to think careful, carefully about what kind of physics problems are most amenable to this novel computational strategy. And in fact, we kind of need to work simultaneously on three different interconnected areas in order to make progress. So the first is the sort of theoretical developments, which is a question of, well, how do we actually take our theories and write them in a way that's compatible with a quantum computer. So the same way that people in the 60s and 70s, or 70s and 80s took the strong interactions, took QCD and figured out how to write it in a way that it worked well for a, quant for a classical computer. 
we have to do the exact same thing in figuring out how it works for quantum computers. We also have to think about algorithmic developments. It's not enough to have a good pen and paper idea, but we also have to figure out how to map it onto a quantum circuit. And importantly, that that quantum circuit can run in a reasonable amount of time. Um, you know, if your quantum circuit scales exponentially in length and takes the age of the universe to run, that, ca that calculation is not possible and a quantum computer won't help you. And then lastly, there's an idea of benchmarking and optimization, namely asking what hardware is sort of best suited um, for the physics problem that we want to do. And so this is kind of why it's interesting having um, both, for example, these superconducting qubit machines and also trapped ion machines being developed at the same time, because they have fundamentally different ways of networking and working. And so some might be better suited for different problems than others. Okay, well, what about sort of specifically the quantum simulations of the standard model, right? I started off this talk saying, you know, what we really want to understand is how all of the complexity that we see around us emerges from the, the standard model. And the important thing here is that this is an incredibly young field. We're really in the early days of this research direction. And also the technology is rapidly evolving. So the two of these kind of come together and it means that there are many, many questions that we do not yet know the answer to. So on the theoretical side, it was just really trying to figure out how to use quantum computers. There's the big question of how do we encode the standard model force carriers onto a quantum computer? It's far from obvious how to do this. It's far from obvious what the best method is. Additionally, we know that the standard model has very important fundamental laws to it, things like charge conservation, that an electron can't just pop out, on the, out of the vacuum on its own. We have Gauss's law that has to be imposed. All of these fundamental components of the standard model have to be encoded onto a quantum computer. This is what people are currently working on. Also, the question of efficiency. Can we try and find a really short circuit that does the physics that we want? Or do we have to wait for what are called fault tolerant quantum computers where this noise goes down and we can kind of manage having really long circuits? Now, this is all the sort of practical side of how we actually take the standard model and encode it onto a quantum computer. But then there's the question that we actually want to be answering. So these are things like, how does a neutron star behave? Again, we have experimental um, probes of it, things like neutron star mergers, so on and so forth, but we can't actually look at a neutron star on a computer. So this is one of the things that we're hoping a quantum computer could do. One of my personal deep interests is the question of, well, what if the weak force, which can distinguish left from right, was not so weak? How would that look? And then also, well, how does the early universe behave within the sort of constraints of the standard model? And are we missing something? Is there something that explains this matter-antimatter asymmetry, or do we have to introduce new physics? And I think the sort of main takeaway that I, that I want to leave you with, I'm happy to sort of answer this in, in questions, is that there's plenty of work that can be done as an undergraduate or early graduate student. Um, so in terms of getting uh, into this work, it's a really, really exciting time. Um, and so with that, I'll actually stop here and go for questions. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing talk. <laughs> um, and I really think you did a great job at kind of breaking it down because it's a little overwhelming for some people to try to understand. Um, so those of you that are in the audience, if you would like to add any questions in the chat, um, feel free to do so. Uh, one of my questions for you is, I think it's um, just pretty cool that you work at CERN. So <laughs> I'm a former physics student, and that was always kind of the ultimate place to work at. Can you share a little bit of what that's like? Yeah, I, <laughs> good. It, it, it's amazing. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked at some national labs in the U.S., um, but CERN is this incredible environment because it's, it's quite large. I mean, we have, I think, like 3,000 employees, but then 17,000 users throughout the world um, that all come in on site and use, you know, the detectors and the, the colliders. Um, 
So it is an incredibly vigorous scientific experience um, where you know you overlap with scientists who work on fundamentally different things from you, and yet you can kind of have a you know shared interest and shared discussion over coffee. Um, you know, so for example, one of my good friends is a vacuum scientist because vacuums are really important for these these beam collisions. Um, and so they deal with very different questions, but it's great actually getting to hear how the engineers see the detector. Um, awesome. And one thing that we kind of work on in education, and that's my current field is education and STEM and trying to kind of encourage the scientists to work with the engineers, to work with the mathematicians. Um, mm -hmm. And hearing you say that, you know, you really can't have a successful system without communication across all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, yeah, and it, and it definitely works both ways, right? So, you know, some of the ideas that we work with in trying to, you know, take the standard model and put it onto a quantum computer, there's some very deep, you know, theoretical questions there. There's some very deep mathematical questions there that, you know, we're turning to sort of the mathematics literature. I mean, this also goes back all the way, you know, to, completely changing topics. The thing about general relativity, trying to understand how gravity works. Einstein couldn't have figured out the math if one of his friends wasn't a non-Euclidean geometrist, one of like the three working in the world. So we need the mathematicians, but then also the engineers, they tell us when we propose things that just can't be done <laughs> because they know, they, they know what's feasible. Yeah. So another question I have for you is, <laughs> What led you to CERN? So if you were to kind of explain, you know, what were some turning points in your life that, that got you to where you are? Mm -hmm. You want to share that? Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, I, I come from a pretty strong physics background. Uh, my, my father is an uh, atmospheric physicist. Um, so there was always a lot of physics discussion in the home and, you know, doing experiments and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I guess it was, you know, once I knew I wanted to do physics, then it was kind of seeing, you know, the various places that felt like they would be the best fit for me scientifically. Now, I didn't always know I wanted to do physics. It was only once I couldn't understand classical mechanics and was infuriated by this um, that actually physics started to interest me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, coming to CERN was really a question of, did I want to be at a place, you know, that was sort of smaller and perhaps I would know everyone, you know, on my floor, or do I want to be in this really big place where I definitely don't know everyone, but I might run into someone who works on a fundamentally different topic. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I wanted that because someone who's been fairly formal my entire life, understanding the, all of the nitty gritty that goes into experimental physics is so important. Mm -hmm. um, especially when we read about it in textbooks, it seems so simple. And you actually start digging into what's possible. <laughs> it's very different. Yeah. And it seems like such a magical place because it is bringing people together from all over the mm -hmm. world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, and you know, the, the labs in the U.S. are the same way, but I, I can only imagine that CERN just takes it to another level. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. I mean, because, you know, with the, with the U.S. labs, I mean, the U.S. itself is a giant country, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so if you fly, let's say, four hours or three hours from Fermilab, um, you are still usually in the US, mm -hmm. right? You fly three hours, you know, from Geneva and you're probably over the water um, or, or Roger, you're probably like either going across the water in like far Eastern Europe slash Asia um, or over Africa. So everything is so close together. So you get people from, you know, different backgrounds all coming together because it's, it's just easier to bring everyone together. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm seeing on your last slide that there's plenty of work that can be done as an undergraduate or early um, graduate student. Uh, I know, I believe CERN offers some internships or opportunities for students. Um, do you want to share any of that? Yeah, so we have, uh, there is the CERN S Student Summer Internship. 
Um, and that is a chance to work with either experimentalists or theorists um, on sort of, you know, some of the projects that, that we come up with. Um, mm -hmm. So that's essentially is you, you get to come to CERN for, I think it's like 10 weeks during the summer, um, and then actively engage in the research that's being done here. Um, so that's probably the sort of most easily accessible one. Um, there are, is also work being done on bringing in like doctoral students um, for this quantum technology initiative. And that initiative also has sort of its own programs that are starting to get spooled up to allow students to come to CERN to start engaging in, in quantum mechanics and sort of quantum research. Awesome. All right, well, if there isn't any other questions um, in the chat or from the audience, uh, the Rages team very much appreciates your time. We thoroughly enjoyed your talk and um, thank you so much for you know sharing part of your day with us. Of course, always happy to do so. Yes, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we will see you at our next talk. Have a Bye, great day. Bye.